So hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa Rajian, Chair of the Land Use Committee for the Studio City Neighborhood Council. Um, it is Wednesday, May 11, 2022. It is now 7.05 p.m. I'll go ahead and take roll. Um, Lisa Karajian here. Uh, Jesse Porter. Here. Richard Niederberg. Absent. Dean Cutler. Here. Adele Slaughter. Here. We have a quorum. I did not call Lana, right? Lana is excused. Um, I do not have any announcements or anything to report. I will have a message at the end of the meeting um, that has to do with a former um, land use committee member. Um, aside from that, we will move on to public comments. Do I have any raised hands? Yes, you have Patty Kirby. Jamie York, uh, Barry Livingston. Patty, go ahead. Hey, everybody. Um, Lisa, I'm just wondering what's happening with the ad hoc committee for uh, the Weddington project. And um, we missed a deadline for this neighbor council, obviously, <clears throat> for this round. So I'm kind of concerned. Not uh, I yeah. I do not have an answer for you for that, only because I am not in charge of the ad hoc committee for the Harvard Westlake project. Um, Randy was handling that with putting together the committee and its members. I think he's been in touch with several people. I'm not sure I haven't had an update from him, uh, the deadline was yesterday at 4 p.m. Um, I had urged everyone to send in their own comments and suggestions and recommendations. I hope everyone took advantage of that and made sure that they got it in uh, by 4 p.m. yesterday. Aside from that, I don't have any information for you. I'm so sorry. So could you put it on next month's agenda for sure. follow-up from Landis? Yeah. I can see we spent a lot of time on it at the last land use meeting and nothing happened. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, next, we have Jamie York. Um, yeah, I was just hoping that I could get an update on the, the Weddington project as well. Um, I wanted to sort of report back to my NC because it's a topic that we're also interested in. So that's that's why I was popping in before I have to actually go to my own meeting at 7.15. Right. Um, as you heard me just answering Patty's question, unfortunately, I was uh, not in charge of the ad hoc committee. Um, that was being handled by Randy Freed, uh, the president of the Neighborhood Council for Studio City. So I'm not sure where he's at. I haven't had an update. Um, but last month, I did make sure that everyone knew to send in their comments to Kimberly Henry directly. Okay, thanks so much. Um, if you guys do get an update one way or the other, I'd love it if somebody could shoot me over an email just so that, because like I like to report back on things that we've done CIS is on so that we can, you know, stay updated on the things we are interested in. Sure. Thank you. Definitely. Terry Austin. Oh, hi. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, my comment was about Reddington as well and about the ad hoc. Um, I um, I know that it was uh, Randy uh, who put it together, and I just want to say that it, I'm just repeating something we all know that I, I know that 2,000 letters were generated just by one organization in the last six weeks about it. So to our new councilwoman, so clearly our neighborhood is very concerned about this, and it is the largest project. Uh, land use project we have going forward. So I don't know how it works if there was an ad hoc that was established or 
was talked about, but then actually nothing happened with, with one uh, committee or the board, if this could now be put on the agenda for an ad hoc for land use, because Lisa, in my experience, if you say you're going to do it, it's going to get done. So I'm just hoping that they perhaps can the ad hoc be switched to land use and uh, actually, you know, move it down the field. Um, the next thing that's going to happen is the public hearing, and that will be anywhere from 60 days to six months. We don't know. But if it does turn out to be 60 days, we don't want to miss the boat again. So I'm hoping that you'll put your capable hands on this. Thank you. Thanks. Tess Taylor. Hi. Um, can I be heard? Yes. Uh Excellent. Thank you. Hello. My Hi. name is Tess Taylor. I'm the president of the West Toluca Lake Residents Association, immediately adjacent to you. I am also an elected board member of an adjacent neighborhood council. I've been following this with great interest. Our, our um, resident association wrote a letter of support of the designation of the Weddington Studio City Golf and Tennis Club in August, supporting it as a historic cultural monument. So we've been following this very closely. Um, I understand the deadline for comments to the DEIR was yesterday, and I wanna make sure no important deadlines are missed and that this is properly agendized, whether for the ad hoc and or the land use and or the general board meeting, very, very important. And I wanna remind everyone here that neighborhood councils are here to serve the public. We are not here to serve moneyed interests or allow them to control our public policies. That's precisely the opposite of what we should do. We need to make sure that residents are heard. I do not think that developers are inherently bad, but what makes them bad is not their desire to build, it's their desire to always build something that is not code comp compliant. And I wanna very much protect against overdevelopment. I believe that neighborhood councils are not a lobbying organization. We're not a PAC or a trade association or a group of cheerleaders for overdevelopment. We wanna keep our homes and neighborhoods without any more intrusion or overdevelopment. So we look to neighborhood councils to protect us against that. Um, it's not an association of people who misappropriate or obstruct the process by exploiting weak and feeble elected representative, which in itself is reprehensible. So I look to this, this committee and to this board to protect the interests of residents. And I appreciate everything and anything that you do to advance that interest and to uh, stop anything that would interfere with residential quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Mandel. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I too want to talk about uh, Harvard Westlake River Park. Uh, I know we had uh, last month's uh, land use meeting where for over two hours people were pleading either in opposition or in support, and they seemed to be under the impression that they were uh, making their case for the Studio City Neighborhood Council to then put something in, whether it's ad hoc, a motion, anything as to whether the neighborhood council supports or opposes the project at this time. As we heard from the previous speakers, we missed uh, a very important deadline. It sounds like the adjacent neighborhood councils are waiting on us, or waiting on Studio City Neighborhood Council to do something, not just pass on the issue. I'm not saying the land use committee did something wrong. I'm saying the neighborhood council, our neighborhood council, I think looks bad. We missed a deadline. And I would like to suggest that the land use committee form an ad hoc for this now, as soon as possible, and then have this agendized every single uh, board meeting and land use meeting from now until the project is over. Also, if you could let us know if Harvard, if this Harvard Westlake project and other projects in Studio City, if and when they, be, they come uh, before the specific plan, the Planning Review Board or the South Valley Planning Commission, where you vote on those things. If you can update us in your chair announcements as to if and when the Studio City projects are coming before you and what's happening with those, I think a lot of people would appreciate that kind of an update. Thanks. Thank you. Peter Cole. Hi. I uh, also want to uh, make a comment about the uh, Harvard lack of the uh, uh, Harvard Westlake uh, ad hoc committee. Uh, Lisa, I think that it, while Randy took this ball and hid it under his shirt for however long, uh, 
I saw that happen. But I do believe that being this being the largest project to hit Studio City probably ever, I would think that the second the DEIR hit the inbox of the Land Use Committee that you would have insisted upon a, a mass email go out to the public on this and the ad hoc been set up. So I don't know, the, ball, the ball's been dropped and it really is a bad look for you because now you have an appointment to the South Valley Planning Commission. Is this project going to come before the Planning Commission and you get another bite at the apple? So it really looks like a conflict of interest and it really does look like a big conflict of interest when you didn't move on it right away. And it's not <coughs> fair to Harvard Westlake and it's not fair to the uh, opposition to the project. Thank you. Thank you. Barry Johnson. Hi, I just wanted to say that the SCRA filed a 600 page document response yesterday. So it's not like all is forgotten. And I also wanna remind everyone that having gone through six or seven of these DEIRs in the last 16 years, for me at least, the Neighborhood Council, in responding to a DEIR, has never taken a position. We've only asked questions to be responded to. So keep that in mind, everyone. Um, and, and the third thing, last thing I want to say is somebody mentioned that neighborhood councils were created, you know, to be against developers. Well, neighborhood councils are all about stakeholders. They're made up of stakeholders. And as much as any of you or me do not like the fact, do not like developers, they are stakeholders. They have a say as much as we do. So when you start saying, you know, we didn't do this against the developers. Well, our side of it is just one side. The developers have their side, and they are also stakeholders. And every last person needs to remember that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Can everyone please mute themselves? I would really appreciate it until you're called upon for your public comment. <clears throat> Hi, good evening. Um, so anyways, for starters, I, I agree with Terry uh, and Scott as well. I think that it should be um, an ad hoc should be switched to land use. Um, I've heard a lot of what's been going on and the president definitely dropped the ball and did not follow through with the ad hoc committee or give them instructions as to to move on it. And as Peter said, it, it should have been done 60 days ago, as soon as that DEIR came out, not to, not to, it, it there wasn't even enough time to discuss it at, um, at a regular meeting f for the, um, it, so anyways, that's just my thoughts. I agree with everybody. And uh, should be moved. Hopefully, we can make make uh, a difference the next time around. Thank you. Thank you, Barry Livingston. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I'm kind of new to this group, uh, although I'm not new to the San Fernando Valley. I moved here in 1963 to Studio City, and grew up there. And used oh, the uh, excuse me. No, in any case, uh, you know, I'd like to uh, second all the thoughts that Tess Taylor put forward. I'm, I'm actually a resident now of West Toluca Lake, but I still use the golf course. And, you know, there are, once it's gone, it's gone. You know, they'll never have a jewel like that in, in our community. It certainly benefits children looking for things to do. It's a, an environmental way station for, for birds, um, you know, and um, I, I see it as, as the, the entire uh, whole facility as a beneficiary to the, the entire community, whereas um, you know, Westlake will certainly benefit from from personally and you know privately, most likely for the development of their sports, uh, you know, whatever arena that they want to build there. But uh, that to me seems like it's not in the great interest of the greater public. 
And uh, anyway, those are my thoughts on that. Uh, I, I hope that uh, all the people involved, the councils, will um, push all their energy towards saving something that, that is truly a jewel that will, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. So they need to keep it. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie Winter? Yes, thanks. Um, I'm also a little perplexed. Uh, um, we spent a good, um, I don't know, five, six hours in total last month between sustainability and land use discussing Harvard Westlake. And I think it was a little late that the president established an ad hoc, but I, I'm a little flummoxed that land use was not uh, brought into that ad hoc or coordinated because it was made very clear that land use was where our response to the DIR through which it would come. That's the committee through which it would come. And stakeholders all came and spent hours of time um, giving their thoughts to the land use committee and the sustainability committee. And for that to just evaporate is, is it, it, we're serving the stakeholders and that's not serving the stakeholders, I think. Um, if I believe the ad hoc committee did produce a document that was largely focused on areas of concern. Um, I don't know if they were also representative. I don't know, Lisa, if you took notes on, you know, recurring themes at that last land use meeting, but I, I think it was at, at least representative of what a lot of the key concerns were where the land use committee would have some sort of space to weigh in and request more answers on. But I, it, it appears that the president did not respect the efforts of the stakeholders who commented in committee or the ad hoc group that worked and nothing was delivered um, to the DEIR on behalf of the neighborhood council. And so that is, that's a cumulative hundreds if not thousands of hours of disrespected of voices in this community. We're, we're told to get involved with the neighborhood council because it's the way that we weigh in and then to have that just evaporate, it's a stunning failure. Um, so I'm, I'm a little perplexed that you weren't, you know, uh, uh, actually, you know, in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, brought into that process so that it, we could be ensured that the committee would have that voice. But it's almost misleading to have people come and spend time in committee and then not deliver anything. I'm just, I'm really <laughs> a massive, failure. We should never be putting all of that, something that important into the hands of one person. So that you weren't part of this, Lisa, is, a, you know, to leave it up to the president alone and then to have him betray everybody is, is stunning, really stunning. And I don't know how that lends, how do you encourage people to weigh in here? You know, again, in the future, how, how do we encourage the people to, tr to trust the integrity of the process? And I, you know, I also would, would agree that it's probably good if you can bring your schedule for hearing things in Studio City to include it in every agenda so that stakeholders can, in, you know, have, a, have confidence in the integrity of the process. Because I think this erode, this, what happened here erodes that confidence pretty significantly. So anything you can do, Lisa, personally to build that confidence back up, I think will be important. Thanks. Thank you. LACA. Okay, hello. Um, this is Fred Iberry, a resident of Duke Lake Studio City Border. And uh, I don't think there's really anything I can say that, that hasn't been said already. I, I really admire what Melanie just said, and I, I, I echo everything she said, and also Tess Taylor as well. Um, so I'm not going to repeat what they said, but I just want to let you guys know. I, I am in step with these two women. I think they're absolutely on target. And I really hope that you guys uh, listen to what they're saying. Thank you so much. Thank you. I had to raise my hand. David, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, David Wheatley. I'm a uh, stakeholder in Silver Lake and I'm a stakeholder in Toluca Lake and uh, very concerned about this Harvard-Westlake matter. And I understand that there, uh, something that needed to be on the agenda tonight is totally absent. I'm also concerned about the number four response to public comments by committee members. It's my understanding that under the Brown Act, 
the uh, committee members are not permitted to discuss or even acknowledge receipt of any comments on non-agenda items. So that number four does not seem uh, appropriate uh, to me. And I support what uh, any sort of admonitions and a rescheduling of this particular topic to make sure it is properly agendized. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Great. Yeah. May I speak? Who is that? Jonathan Gregory. Gregory, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm a stakeholder in nearby West Toluca Lake. The West Toluca Lake Residents Association had taken a stand. I'm not gonna go through the whole matter, but it certainly is in protection of open spaces and everything an open space brings to residents of a community. Um, I think it falls on the lap or on the shoulders of a board of a neighborhood council to be asking other board members what's in the best interest in the long term and in the present for stakeholders. No one else. That's the sole mandate of a neighborhood council that often gets lost in the, in the motions, in the activities, and even in the language. So I recommend that you all pause and take a look that once open space is lost, it's financially unretrievable. So what you do with it really matters. I listened previously in meetings where people talked at great length about walls and being walled out of that. I remember distinctly the limitations placed on visits from the public. So once again, I fall back that you have outrage in written form from other residential communities near you. And I recommend you pay close attention to what you're hearing. People are not content with this process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay. Moving on to, um, uh, we'll go into the presentation, discussion, and possible motion. The proposed project is the Crescent Apartments um, in the C2-1VL-RIA zone. The project address is 4260 North Arch Drive, as well as 11201 West Ventura Boulevard. Case number CPC-2017-3759. Dash DB dash SPP dash SPR ENV dash two zero one seven dash three seven six zero dash EAF a one hundred and twenty nine unit five story one hundred fourteen thousand four square total feet of floor area apartment building maximum height of seventy six feet to the highest point, includes 145 parking spaces on two subterranean levels, utilizing on-menu, um, excuse me, hang on, I think I missed a point, maximum height of 76 feet to the highest point, density bonus apartment building with 17 units set aside for very low income tenants, Total lot area of 44,886.8 square feet includes 145 parking spaces on two subterranean levels, utilizing on menu incentives for increased FAR of 3.1 in lieu of 1.1, and on menu to allow 70% lot coverage in lieu of 60%, and off menu to allow a height of 76 feet in lieu of 45 feet, and relief from transitional height requirements and waiver of development standard to allow no commercial space in a commercial corner. Currently, it's a vacant lot. It's the former site of a residential care uh, facility for the elderly that has gone through demolition. Uh, we have Jonathan Riker as the representative, as well as did you uh, want to introduce your team members, Jonathan? Are there any others that will be joining in this presentation? Uh, 
Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Yes, yes, there are. Uh, I, I'm Jonathan Riker. I'm the uh, land use counsel for the project team. And I, I wanna turn it over to Emily Taylor, who is the project manager uh, from the developer side with uh, Goldrich Kest. So Emily, if you're there. I'm here. I don't know if you there can you. see me. I yeah, Jonathan, oh, there, there you are. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, my name is Emily Taylor. I'm with Goldrich Cast. We're a longtime operator and owner of apartments, uh, both uh, market rate and affordable communities in Los Angeles and throughout California. Um, we previously entitled this site for a different project, and, and we're very excited to present the updated project here to you tonight. Um, we've got a new developer, new architecture team with us, uh, Lehman Architects. Mark Lehman is on the call, as well as Johannes Ubin. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to Johannes. He's going to present um, the differences in the two projects that, that we previously presented to you, um, and, and then the, the project that we're excited to present to you going forward. So I'll turn it over to Johannes. Okay, give me one second, please. I just want for the record to be known that Richard Niederberg, uh, the committee member of land use has joined the meeting and um, hey, Johnson. So this project, uh, the Crescent Apartments was um, presented to land use uh, in September of 2019. So the plans have changed um, somewhat. And here we are with a new presentation, with a new look. I have shared my um, making co-host, whoever's gonna be presenting so that I can share the screen with you. Let me know who that would be. I'll be presenting. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi. Oh, well, nice to see you again. Um, how do I do this here? Oh, share screen. Okay. Let me know if you can see. Yes. All right, and uh, thank you for having us. And uh, let me know if I'm going too fast. I sometimes do. So this presentation is split in four parts. Um, a quick site analysis. Uh, we, we're going to go over to building design. We're going to look at the overall floor plans, elevations, and then um, we're going to look at the project data. So you likely know this site quite well. This is uh, right on Arch Drive, um, about a mile between the Universal City Metro, Universal City Metro and uh, CBS Silla Triangle. Um, it's right on the LA River next to the Marshalls on Ventura Boulevard. Um, so yeah, you know the sites, of course. Um, for the immediate context, this is a site uh, that is uh, currently has been dem demolished. Um, to the west, we have the Studio City Place and Marshalls. Um, to the east, we have two-story apartment buildings, four-story apartment buildings, and it goes up from there. Uh, south of here is a little parklet right on the bend of Ventura Boulevard, and north of the side, of course, the LA River. Here's a quick um, preview of um, the streetscape and uh, the relative height of the building. Um, so you have the marshals, uh, about three stories on the west side. Moving over, we have um, some smaller residential buildings, um, a larger four-story one. Um, then moving down, we have a large, I believe this is a five-story um, apartment building at the end, just to get you a bit of a context. I mean, these are not perfectly scaled, but I think you get the gist. Um, and just um, to reiterate, on the north side of the site is the LA River and it is the proposed future path of the LA River Path project. Um, obviously, this is still in development, and um, you know, I haven't seen the latest plans for this yet. Um, and as you know, the development is complex, and there's multiple stakeholders involved. But it's important to our project because you know we are proposing a connection from our building onto the Riverwalk. Um, and just a very quick overview of 
sort of the environmental factors. Um, you know, we have strong winds from the north. Uh, you know, the sun goes up in the south side on the corner of the building and shades the north. And we're expecting a lot of noise pollution from uh, Ventura Boulevard. This is a busy intersection. Getting into the project design. Um, so we wanted to start with a quick overview of the previously entitled project versus the current one. So the previous project was 106 units, um, and we are now at 129 units. Uh, this is really driven by um, a requirement to get a little bit more density in the project because the unit costs of the previous project were infeasible, um, especially with all the increased costs you know, due to COVID and um, supply chain. We previously had 12 um, affordable units of very low income. We're now at 17 very low income units. Um, the building layouts. So previously we were looking at the three bar layouts. There are single loaded corridors each. The updated design of the project is a U-shaped double loaded corridor building. Um, and really this was driven by just being an inefficient design and um, a, a lot of surface area for uh, a building this size. Um, in terms of the building height, previously entitled was 733 feet um, and the current building is 75 feet. And just um, to clarify, the, the way the height is defined in the specific plan for Ventura Boulevard here is that we measure from the lowest point to the top of the elevator tower. And in this case, this is at the river. So there's quite a drop from the street to um, the building. So in terms of the Rio River access, um, previously as was provided in the Western side yard, there's a 10 foot gap between the Marshall's building and um, our building. And in the current design, we're providing a 15 foot wide side yard on the east side. Um, and this was really driven by, you know, wanting to create a better sort of pass through for the neighborhood. Um, being adjacent to the residential site seemed like a more logical place to put this, especially since it's being used by the neighborhood. Um, also providing a bit of a larger buffer for the neighbors. And um, having this 15 foot wide side yard allowed us to retain all of the existing trees. And there's quite a um, good amount of mature trees. Um, and this was previously also stated by the neighbors that that was something they're really looking for. Um, in terms of the pedestrian experience of the building, previously this building had provided a commercial space, space right in the center. Um, and uh, the current design does not have a commercial space anymore, but we're providing a, you know, a patio with amenity seating on the front yard for the tenants and maybe you know, friends of the tenants that come in and a large storefront that's really sort of intended to relate to the commercial um, you know, corner here. Um, and another thing that we did to help the pedestrian experience here, I think is that we broke up the building in five individual segments making it appear a bit you know, smaller compared to the three larger uh, wedges we had before. Again, just to reiterate that idea. So we have the, this is up elevation of the streets, the C zone on the west and the R zone on the east with the multifamily. Um, we have um, the C zone on the west, R zone on the east side. Um, and so the idea is that we're sort of stepping up, showing a storefront on the west side and the building then stepping down towards the R zone and providing, um, you know, its lower shoulder towards the residential multifamily site. Um, and another aspect of this project is the transitional height. So we have a LA River with the Rio zone on the north side, which requires us to provide uh, by right transitional height. So you can see the red dotted line is what the by right um, height would require. So what we are proposing, because we're, uh, I'll have a site that falls quite dramatically on the property line to the south or uh, north, um, is that we are still providing a transitional height or adhering to it by providing a 45 degree angle off 25 feet off the ground from the bottom of the adjacent property site. 
Um, and here are a few project renderings to sort of illustrate a project again. So this is on the intersection of Ventura and Arch Drive. Um, again, seeing that amenity space on the south, uh, on the western corner, next to the Marshalls building, building entry, and then the idea of this building stepping down towards the residential neighborhood. Um, a frontal view. So one of the most important aspects we had here was that we broke up the center of the building and providing glazing in the middle as well to allow pedestrians to really get the view through and um, all the way back into the mountains um, beyond. And again, you can start seeing that um, side yard, the 15 foot side yard with the um, gate. So this is, would be a time gate that would be open during the daylight hours. Uh, the side yard, which is the pedestrian pass through to the Rio River zone. Um, really the idea is that there are some spaces that people can uh, you know, stay and utilize um, as well as um, some nice planting and uh, existing trees. In reality, they're a little bit larger than what we show here. Another aspect I think that is important to us is these balconies that will provide for um, much needed ice on the street um, as you know, to make sure that there's always somebody watching this side yard. And here's a, a view from the riverside uh, with the, you know, proposed bike path location. Um, again, so the idea really here is that this building is stepping down towards the uh, marshals and the residential neighborhoods to the north, or I guess northeast, um, and sort of stepping up carefully um, to create sort of a really beautiful riverfront, but also providing people that live here a beautiful place to exist and live. Um, there's also a um, pedestrian path for the tenants on the rear with uh, platforms that they can sit in and look over the river, um, but this would be um, available only to the tenants. And just to clarify something, um, the bike path and the access that's shown here is only part of the concept. So because it is part of the um, river walk, um, this is something that would have to be um, done whenever that gets developed. Um, and it's not part of the project so, or the project uh, property line. But this is the concept of how we are thinking this should all connect. Um, I'm getting into the floor plans now. Uh, this is the lower parking level, uh, very straightforward. Um, upper parking level, so this is like on the uh, lower end of the uh, at the riverside, right? Um, there's amenity zone in the southwest, um, and you enter right from the middle, um, going up onto the uh, main floor, the first floor of Arch Drive. Uh, so you enter in the center, you enter to the left into the lobby. There is some um, co-working spaces for the um, uh, tenants. And then you would enter back into the main building. You see also that we have provided some balconies on the rear towards the river. Stepping up the building, um, you see that we provide um, balconies towards the center courtyards, but also in both of the side yards, larger balconies on the east and smaller towards the marshals. Stepping up, you start seeing that the building is starting to step back uh, with the transitional heights and providing terraces for the tenants. And on the fourth floor, we're also providing um, common decks for the tenants to um, you know, be out there and be at the river. Also larger private decks. And again, we're continuing up with the balconies, which are not continuous, but they're staggered somewhat going up the building sides. Stepping up to the top floor, we now have um, even more terraces, of course, and um, a common deck, which really helps us to transition down towards the residential neighborhood and the small private deck towards the um, Marshall site, which is uh, and a little sort of like um, patio, outdoor space, walled garden type idea, and the roof, um, which is not occupied. The front elevation, again, showing a storefront, uh, the, the see-through and stepping down towards the um, residential neighborhood. 
uh, the side yard on the east with the balconies, which sort of stagger along the building and showing that transition, um, transitional height up. Um, the western side yard towards the uh, Marshall's building, a lot more balconies. They're a little bit smaller and they're somewhat recessed in the building to um, uh, you know, adhere to the zoning requirements for setbacks. And the rear of the building, uh, which shows you how we're stepping carefully up towards the adjacent buildings, which you can see here and there. This is the Marshall's. And here's a, just a quick 3D overview of the building from the arch drive and uh, from the river side. Um, I'm going to give the um, microphone to Jonathan Riker to get into the project information. Great. Thank, thank you, Johannes. Um, yeah, so. I'm Jonathan, gonna go over. Jonathan yes. one second. Can you uh, clarify as to which address is the primary address? Got it. We, we're going to use uh, the 4260 Arch Drive as a primary address. I know that that issue came up last time, and, and we intend to have everything submitted with that address um, as the primary one. Okay. And um, yeah, so I'll go through the entitlements and just kind of the, the applications that we're submitting. Uh, and then afterwards, we're happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Uh, so similar to last time, we will be submitting a density bonus application. Um, it will go to the city planning commission uh, due to the off menu density bonus, uh, yeah, off menu incentive request. Uh, there will also be a specific plan project compliance with the Ventura Coenga Boulevard specific plan and, and site plan review. Uh, now, as we um, mentioned, as, as Lisa, I think you mentioned earlier, the goal here was to modify the project that had been previously approved. Uh, and as of now, the city is, is actually hoping to approve a new process and procedures ordinance, which would allow previously approved density bonus projects such as this to go forward with a, with a modification process rather than a brand new application. Uh, unfortunately, that process is not yet approved. So these are new, um, it's, a, it's a new application, but it really is a modification of the previous project. And, and the general rule is that if you don't change anything by more than 20%, you can stick within this um, modification process. Um, so here, uh, what we're doing is, as you can see with the density bonus calculations, uh, the base density is 113 units per the state density bonus regulations uh, as codified by the city. Uh, we are, um, requesting three incentives, which I'll mention in a little while. Uh, as a result, 15% of the base density is required to be set aside as affordable for very low income uh, tenants. So that, that's 17 units. Um, the maximum allowable density under state density bonus law, which is a 35% density bonus, is 153 units. And uh, we are proposing 129, so not, not the full amount, which was similar to last time. And this is just under a 20% increase in the number of units that we proposed previously. So again, sticking within that 20% range to, to consider this more, more like a modification than a brand new project. Um, the incentive requests are the same as last time, except for one more request and, 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 and an additional waiver, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, the first uh, incentive is uh, for floor area. And this is an on-menu request uh, to allow a floor area ratio of three to one in lieu of one to one. Uh, this is by virtue of the fact that the project is located on Ventura Boulevard, um, which is a major highway within a certain distance of transit. Uh, and the one to one um, FAR is what is allowed under the specific plan. So, so that is an on-menu incentive to exceed that limit. Uh, the second request is also an on-menu incentive. It's to allow for um, an increase in lot coverage to 70% from the 60% maximum in the specific plan. Uh, so this is, a, this is a change from last time, um, basically to just allow a little bit more lot coverage for the building. Uh, the third request is, is very similar to last time. It's a height incentive request, which is the off-menu request uh, because of the off menu density bonus request, it will go to the city planning commission uh, like last time. Uh, this would allow a maximum height of 75 feet 
uh, which is to which is measured to the top of the rooftop elevator shaft uh, in lieu of 45 feet, which is the allowed height under the zoning designation and the specific plan. Uh, just wanted to keep in mind that even though the maximum height is technically 75 feet, the building height, the actual height at the uh, street frontage is, is lower, as, as Johannes mentioned in, in the presentation. And it really is consistent with uh, some of the buildings on that street. Uh, it appears to be a four-story building. Um, and the middle of the, of the building is, is a five-story building. Um, so even though it's 75 feet, it really seems much higher than the actual height because the way, of the way the city requires height to be measured from the lowest point on the property to the highest point of the building. And given the, the sloping lot, that, that would explain why 75 feet is the technical height although it really isn't quite that high. Uh, in addition to the incentive for the just general height limit, we're also requesting relief from the transitional height requirement. Um, and that is imposed by virtue of the location of the property next to an open space zone. Uh, so that's where the city's transitional height requirements come, to, come into play. Uh, but even though we're not, we, we are requesting relief from it, we are including the step back design that Johannes mentioned to uh, honor the intent of, the, of, the, of that requirement and also to have a step back design, um, just not, not quite as low as, as what is required under the code. Uh, one more request we're asking, and this is what, what the city calls a waiver, uh, which is a more minor request, is relief from the commercial uh, corner requirements. So, so we're not including any commercial space. So uh, we, we found that last time, including that space was problematic. It would be very difficult to make it feasible, uh, especially given the fact that the property is located adjacent to a large shopping center and there are other uh, commercial uses nearby um, for, for, you know, for the tenants in the, in the building. So we're asking for a relief from requiring any commercial uh, use in the building. Uh, also that would reduce the amount of required parking and reduce traffic. So we think that would be helpful overall to the project in making it less impactful. Uh, so, so that's a basic overview, but uh, please let us know if you have any questions. I'm sure, I'm sure some questions come into mind and we're happy to, to answer your questions. Can you uh, point to where the pool is gonna be and talk about that? Sure. Yes, um, let me like that. And I should have painted it in. I should have painted it in blue and not in green. Uh, but the pool is on the rear, on top of the parking deck. Um, uh, it's separated in a separate zone on the very north end of the um, podium. And maybe I'll show you in the rendering too. You can kind of see it peeking through here. So it's to the rear of the building. It's to the rear of the building. I think it's well isolated from the neighbors. Can you talk about how many um, units you have that are single, one bedroom, two bedroom? Um, yes, I can. Give me one second while I pull that up. Um, let's see. So we have. Um, 75 one bedroom, 32 two bedroom, one three bedroom, and 21 studios. And which ones um, are going to be of the 17 for um, very low income? They need to be evenly mixed throughout the different unit. Hi, this is Mark Lehman. Um, they need to be evenly mixed throughout the, the, the unit mix. So, the, you know, so they, there will be an even portion. amount of each uh, unit type there. But one thing I want to add is um, within this unit mix, these are actually large units for each size. They're, it's a more luxurious project. So unit sizes on each of those are much larger than normally what you'd see on the market. 
to work with housing to um, to select those units. As Mark mentioned, it will be evenly distributed, um, but of course we'll work with them and that agency to, to decide where they're located in the building um, and, and honor their, their wishes there. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at this picture right here, how high is that front corner? Can yep, someone was, answer that for me? I'm sorry, I, I, I think I was muted. Um, so on the uh, west side from the street up to the top, to this corner. Honest, can you go back to that picture? The rendering? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so from this point to this point here, it's 57 feet. From this point to up here, I believe is 45 feet. I just had this open because it has those numbers. It's 47 feet. I just had this open because it had those numbers. Okay. Which is similar to some of the larger residential buildings down Arch Street. All right, um, let's go ahead and open up to questions from the public. Barry Johnson, go ahead. Hi. Yes, thank you to Jonathan for keeping it an all Arch Drive address. Um, and also, I completely support, um, uh, you know, your relief from the commercial space on the corner. I think it would be problematic having this, a business there and, and, and parking. Um, what I don't get from your presentation, though, is I'm curious between what is buy right and what you can do with the density bonus, is there anything left that this committee can um, talk to you about? Because as far as I see, everything is either buy right or it's, you're entitled to do it because it's a density bonus. So I don't know I'm not even sure why you're doing this presentation. What is up for discussion when the density bonus lets you do so many things and by right lets you do so many things? Uh, I, I'm, I'm very confused on that. Um, and also when you showed us the roof access slide, of all the slides you showed us, it was up the least amount of time. It was like there and gone. So I'm, I'm wondering what's going up, um, what's going on with the roof. Um, but I'm really curious to know, uh, you know, what is up for discussion with this committee? Because it, like I said, between what's by right and what you have in the density bonus, you, it's all, I don't see that there's a, anything that this committee can say, oh, we want you to do this instead of that. So I, I'd really like to know that. Thank you. Why don't uh, one of you go ahead and, or all of you go ahead and answer that question, please. Johannes, why, Johannes, why, why don't you show them like what's going on with the roof decks really quickly and then, and then um, Jonathan can answer to the, the, the incentives and, and what, what we're doing there really quickly. The, the roof, um, basically we have uh, an elevator tower and likely two stair access towers um, for the fire department. We're gonna have um, condensers for the air conditioning for the units. And these hatch zones are um, solar ready um, zones where you know, a future solar collector could be installed. And there's no uses on the roof besides it. That's why. They get, get, explain the roof decks at each level for them. Oh, of course. Um, As they step down, which aren't roof, but. Yeah. Um, so on the uh, fifth floor, there is a roof deck on the southeast corner, which helps us also transition down towards the residential zone. On the north side towards the river, there's larger roof decks, which is part of us, you know, um, stepping the building up. 
And by stepping up, we create these spaces on the roof that we can use as roof decks. So as we're moving down the building, um, there is another series of, this is now the fourth floor, a series of roof decks towards the river. But on the fourth floor, we also have two small sitting areas, which are for all tenants in the building. Um, stepping down a little bit more, now we're almost at the um, you know, edge of the building. We have space for two more um, step downs, which go towards the adjacent side to really get, get it as low as possible there with roof decks. Um, and then, um, yeah, we have the podium deck in the center of the, um, the site. Maybe I'll show you a three-dimensional view. Yeah, th this is basically the roof deck, right? So you have your um, stair towers and elevator tower. Um, you can see that little roof deck. This is from the river side. Uh, the little, little roof deck in the northwest. And then the stepping down roof decks um, on each floor. Um, Thanks. You really answered my question on the roof, but I'm really more concerned about my second question. Jonathan, uh, getting to that, uh, Barry. Jonathan yeah. Riker, can you go ahead and answer? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, th thank you, Barry, for, for your questions. Um, you know, you're right in a sense that a density bonus request, you know, because it is um, a program approved via state law, uh, there, it's it's a little more difficult to for for a, a local jurisdiction to have more have control over what is proposed. Um, I, I will say in this case, though, we we are making one off menu density bonus request for height. Um, it, it's still the burden of proof, if you will, is still on the city to deny a request um, by virtue of usually environmental concerns or impacts. Uh, so. We, and we went through this the last time, and that, that's why we were, very, we were very careful to try to maintain the same building envelope or very close to it. It's not exactly the same, but it's, it's, it's close to what was approved last time since we did have some discussions over the height and wanted to keep it as, as similar as possible to that because we did, we did land in a place last time where, based on comments from the um, neighborhood council, that we made some changes to the height. So that that's you know, one area of discussion, but really, you know, if you feel, you know, I think personally, I, I feel that this, this is an improvement over the, la the last project uh, by far. I, th I think the, the, the breaking up of the facade, the way it steps back from the commercial side to the residential side, uh, the, the light at the entry, uh, the, the big open glass area with, with views through the, through the whole project, I, I think it's really an incredible design. Um, so we welcome any comments on your, on your thoughts on the design um, and also just in general, just any comments that you may think would improve the project where we're, we're happy to, to, to hear them and consider them. Um, but, I, but I think with regard to the height, that's really the main, that's the main area where there, there is, you know, it's an off menu request. So there, there, there's a little more discussion that would be involved there and debate with the city as well. In regard to the height, uh, how does it compare with all the other buildings on Arch Drive? Got it. So um, yeah, I think Johannes has a exhibit. It's actually not the tallest building on the street if you go all the way down the street here on Arch. I did this diagram here. Uh, we did this diagram here to kind of show what's happening here. So we're starting at this corner and walking down the street, looking at all the various buildings along the street. And I did my best to scale them, you know, to match the scale. You know, it could be some skewing. I would say the tallest building is probably this arch view apartments in this corner here with the pool in front. Um, the second tallest is probably this here, which is, I believe, this building here, 4226. Um, yeah. And again, like this is an imperfect science because, you know, we just step, step in front of the buildings and take photos. Um, so I try to use the 
the windows to match the height of the actual building, but you see, you know, things get skewed and, um, but yeah, so there, there's at least two buildings which have the similar, if not larger size than our building. I hope that that answered the question somewhat. And yeah. I didn't go, I didn't go all the way um, around. Um, and I didn't look at the side of the buildings in the south, although I believe um, this donut shaped building is quite large as well. The 4151. Okay, thank you. Terry Austin, what's your question? Um, my question has to, uh, to do with the front of the building. Um, it seems like there's, there's not a lot of trees. And when you showed us the, um, um, the, the property line, there was a, a diagram where you could see where the building, it, it seems like the, the building almost touches the sidewalk and there's very little frontage actually there. And I'm just wondering, uh, the trees that you do have there look like they're at least like, if they'd be like a hundred and um, 102 or 120 inch box um, tree, but there's very few of them. And I'm just wondering if, because the building looks from the back, it looks, it's very attractive, but at the front, it looks pretty monolithic and, and it's, you know, straight up, and I, I understand the, the setbacks, but the building itself looks pretty imposing from the street. And and I'm I just thinking that the bottom of it, I see the grasses, but um, in terms of like actual shade or anything like that, there's really nothing there. Um, and in the back of the building, where the pool is, it's right against like the very edge of the building. And I'm just thinking of the people who go to the the river walk, and I understand it's, you know, it's not completely, uh, the river park rather, it's not completely finished yet, but I'm just wondering if the pool is not gonna be um, uh, like a noise uh, kind of, I'm sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, I'm, I, I just wondered if, if the, the pool won't cause noise to echo that will uh, keep the people from enjoying uh, some sort of uh, uh, quiet, on that, that river park area. So I'll, I'm gonna mute myself so you don't have to listen to my dog. Thank you for that, Terry. Um, does anyone wanna answer that question? Well, I, I think um, looking at the site plan we have, I, I, I believe we, could, we can definitely fit more trees in the front. That, that would be an easy revision. To, to what we have right now you know we're still in the very early actually. conceptual phase but yeah we, we could absolutely put more trees in the front yard w without an issue and and would love to do that um it has to have more curb appeal with a lot more trees a lot more landscaping native plants yeah, yeah. uh I, I agree great 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 comment um and and we we will accommodate that uh, and happy to do that um with respect to the pool location on the north side it is on the north side of the building so we are trying to push it to a location where we can maximize sunlight at the same time um, regarding noise uh we are i don't johannes do you, do you know how hard we are how, how much we are above the river walk level it's probably about 50 feet right yeah, I think that's about. It's a pretty right. huge elevation difference. So sound, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, the river is uh, you, you just right at this bottom bottom edge there. Yeah, and then the the pool lake is up here. So it's maybe forty five feet. Yeah. Yeah, sound will technically travel upwards from there. Also, what kind of uh, studies have been done to go underground to subterranean parking of two levels? Uh, there is a water table there. So I'm just wondering what kind of studies have you guys had um, that will permit you to go down below that far? Uh, I think it's, you know, fairly typical subterranean basement um, water conditions that we, we deal with on most projects in, in Los Angeles. So uh, if you're actually in the water table, um, you know, where, where you dig down and there's water present, you have to deal with dewatering through construction. 
uh, and then you design your basement as they call it like a boat design, right? Where your basement walls are designed to withstand hydrostatic pressure and the waterproofing on the outside is designed appropriately also. So it's really not we really not an, a, an abnormal thing to deal with here. And I would say too that um, compared, and we went through some studies with the last project and, and this project will not be any deeper um, than the first project. And I think it's a little less deep because the first project had a half of a level of additional parking of like a third subterranean level where this one has, has two. And I believe we had uh, done for the previous project a soils report and um, which, you know, measured the water table as well as um, we had a waterproofing consultant on board. Okay, thank you for that. Melanie Winter. Thanks. Um, I just had a couple of questions if you want to talk to what sort of sustainability features you have, what sort of climate what have you done um, with respect to, you know, are you going all electric appliances uh, or are you going standard gas? Um, are you putting solar panels and some battery backup in the project? Are you doing dual pane windows? Are you using heat pumps for your climate, you know, internal climate um, mechanisms? Um, and then also, you know, you are removing a number of existing mature trees on the site. So speaking to the mitigation on that. So that's Mark Lehman. I, th I think I can speak to a few of those. Um, from the de previous design, we're actually much more energy efficient in that the previous design was designed with single loaded corridors. Now we're double loaded corridors. So we've Great, really greatly reduce the amount of uh, exterior surface area, which creates a, a huge improvement right there. Um, the courtyard we've designed to have uh, through cross through breeze from the street through there, so it'll have natural cooling through the courtyard, um, which the units facing the courtyard can also take advantage of. Um, Windows will be dual, dual glazed windows with low E, uh, with low E film on them, which is fairly typical in all projects now in, in the state of California. Um, let me think. What what else? I'm trying to think. What else did you mention? Uh, appliances. Are you going with gas appliances or electric? You're a little bit ahead of us on that, but I'm going to imagine we're going with electric appliances. Okay. Gas is not not really the way of the future. Mm, no, and I'm hoping there aren't any fake gas fireplaces in there either. Uh, fireplace. No, no. Well, we have no fireplaces. There are some fire pits that. They they may have gas, but that's that's a pretty low gas use on on a couple of fire pits. Okay, and then are you considering heat pump for your heat and cooling in the units? And are you doing any solar on the roof and any solar battery storage for emergency backup for the residents? Great questions. Um, you're you are a little bit ahead of us on that, as we are in. We're still in. We're really like at fifty percent schematic design, um, which we, we we get into those issues at a hundred percent schematic design that the start of design development level. So we we haven't gotten to those issues with with the client and determined you know what the advantages are are for them there. We haven't seen any developments that are really, you know, as progressive on these kind of issues in Studio that we, that we would hope to see in Studio City, and so it would be really encouraging to see a developer come forward with some, um, some, you know, getting out ahead of the requirements that are going to be coming down. Um, yeah. So I would encourage you to consider an all of the above strategy on those those things. And I, I think one thing that you know probably will be a big consider uh, consideration on this project is to 
provide more than the bit, the, the minimum required uh, EV charging stations for cars since, um, you know, yeah. this, this client, Golders Crest, is, is much more forward thinking than a lot of the clients we think that, that we work with um, and, and, you know, see the advantage of um, the future in providing that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Tess Taylor. Thank you. Hi there, Tess Taylor here. And um, I'm generally very much, uh, I disfavor overdevelopment, but I think that at least the placement of this is I think better than most to a point. Um, first, I wanna commend um, the young German architect, uh, is it Johannes? Uh, sehr gut gemacht, very good. Um, the uh -huh. rendering is really wonderful. Um, I am actually very familiar with Arch Drive. I had a good friend who lived there almost 30 years ago, highly congested area even then and not much better now, although I think this is a good use of a vacant lot for sure. Um, and certainly along a commercial corridor like Ventura Boulevard. My concern with large buildings like this is always infrastructure. When we see such a high concentration of, of units in such a small area, um, you know, this will place a greater demand on city services like police, fire department, water and power. So is this development um, providing any upgrades or in lieu fees for water, power, infrastructure upgrade? And also uh, to the question of Barry Johnson, uh, why are we here? I think as long as any project comes for comes before a commission for approval, it is not by right. And if I understand this project correctly, it is now a question of additional off menu density bonus items. Is that correct? And I'm sorry for the com combination of questions. I can repeat them if necessary. No, not a problem, not a problem. It, yeah, that is correct. So with regard to the, uh, Request yet. Yeah, this is not a buy right project. Uh, no. no yeah, once you ask for any requests, incentive requests is not technically buy right. O obviously, on menu requests are more routinely granted. Um, that we do have one off menu request, so that that is certainly a discretionary request. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are what infrastructure? Uh, upgrades are being made and or in lieu fees, if any, can you address that? Got it. Okay. So you're also a little bit ahead of us on those questions as well. Uh, we will be conducting a, a CEQA review um, where we'll get into some, some more of those issues. Um, we have the, the advantage of having gone through the project once. So we are more so making updates to the CEQA um, analysis. Um, we have, you know, more units this time, um, 23 more units, I believe. So that's going to increase demand in some ways. Uh, we, and, and we all have a traffic study as well that's being processed right now. Uh, so we don't have all the answers yet, but I, I know there are tra typically traffic in lieu fees that are paid and whatever conditions are required by the city um, regarding infrastructure. We will, of course, comply with them. Um, so yeah, I, I wish I had more information at this time, but we, we just don't know the details yet. And do you anticipate having those answers if, or if it's possible to know? Yeah, we, we will be conducting the, you know, the CEQA analysis and that will be made available to the public uh, before, before the public hearing. So, so right now we've submitted our applications to the uh, expedited processing unit and we wanted to have this meeting earlier rather than later just to get input um, before the projects are too far along. So we, we're not scheduled yet for uh, the, the public hearing. We anticipate that would be in about four months. Um, and we are still waiting on the results from, from the traffic study and other technical studies uh, that we're preparing. And um, until those are done, we won't really know the details on those questions, but um, you know, they'll, they'll definitely be made available to the public. So, Thank you. Yeah. I think really quickly, one thing we haven't, we haven't really mentioned here that that's, I think a, a great offering that, that the owners decided to do is they've decided to put the uh, transformer in a customer station, which means it's underground rather than 
having this horrible huge utility service on you know off the sidewalk here which the previous design had all right great thank you um uh, thank you tess why don't i go ahead and um have the committee weigh in let us start with adele slaughter yes hi um thank you so much for your presentation um i have a few questions for you um I recall last time when you presented that the building next to you was very concerned about your um, the balconies looking into their units. And I know you have that 15 foot walkway there and there's trees, um, but that what's the height of the building next to you about what, 30 feet? The height at the at the end at the last the last iteration, yeah. What's the height of that building? Yeah, I think thirty feet is probably like let's see, it's um. You're forty five feet or, or forty seven. Feet, less than forty five feet That's, off the street. I mean, you're you're sitting off the street, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would say it's between thirty five and forty feet. Yeah. You're the building is 47 feet, you said. Right there. Yeah. So um, I just remember, but then I heard that um, the woman next to you sold you the, her apartment. Uh, so is that right? And you've already demolished that apartment building? No, she we did. Uh, we were talking with her um, to potentially buy her site as well, um, but it, it never really went anywhere. So we went forward with the design um, oh, so I, that, that this doesn't include the, that other apartment building. Then. Oh, the, the site that you see is is what was previously um, the the senior facility that we owned on the site. It, it hasn't expanded. We haven't added any other uh, square footage to the site. Um, I will say to to the balconies, we are working with her closely, but because we've backed that off of that uh, the east side, we're now going to have all of those mature trees that are there. So the screen that exists today will continue to stay put. Um, and, and we do want to have that um, open space for our residents, especially as more people are doing sort of a hybrid working from home, um, as well as having trees on the street for that pedestrian pathway that will now go through um, to the river. So you, you've given her a bit of a buffer there. Absolutely. Where before it was 10 feet, now we've given 15 feet, which allows for uh, the roots of the existing trees to, to, to stay. I think that that was always in question whether they'd actually really be able to survive. So um, you said something about, um, I guess, um, sorry, Jonathan had said something about that uh, under the code, the building requ height requirement would be lower than what it is now, that 47 feet there. Is that, am I, did I understand you correctly? Right, so the, under the current code, 45 feet is the maximum height limit. So we're, ju we're just slightly above that at the uh, street front level. And, and why can't you stick to 45 feet just because? I, I mean, I think it's a design mm. consideration. Um, might be nicer for for the people around. Um, I think it would be nicer anyway. Um, so the other question I had is, do you have a tree report? Have you had a tree report done for what trees are there and how many trees are you taking out? Leave that to Johannes and the. There is a tree report and Johannes, I don't know if we. I don't know if we know offhand exactly how many tree we're keeping by far the majority of the trees um we I, i'm pretty confident that the previous design wouldn't have been able to keep any of the trees except for the ones along the riverside um now with us pulling back 15 feet from 
the east side uh, and also pulling the parking back the, the same amount, the, the, the soil re will remain undisturbed there, which currently there's a very small side yard there of five to six feet. So 15 feet is really going to not even touch the roots there. Um, on the west side, it's going to be a little bit more difficult and we'll have to get an arborist involved. We're trying to save those all also by we're down a little bit lower to get the building and exiting to work. We're building up planters to try and save as many of those trees yet, but it, it's, you know, it, it's going to take a lot of research uh, and effort and work with the arborists to see what we can save on the, uh, on the west side here. But the east side, it's our intention to save every single tree. So I'd love to see the tree report. And does the tree report include what's on the river? Yes, it includes on and off side trees. On, so it, it, it's, it determines, it tells you which. They, they've, they've numbered each tree. And, and the trees are actually tagged in, right. in, on site. Good. Um, so I'd love to see that tree report and um, see what kinds of trees you have there and what kinds of trees are on the river. And you're not taking any of the any of the river um, vegetation down, are you? No. Um, where is the entrance to and from the parking garage? I can't see it. It's right here in the center. Or let me show you on the other slide. Um, I think the elevation shows it quite well. Um, the parking is right here at the center, um, to the right of where you walk into the lobby or into the courtyard. And there's only one way in and out? Only one way in or out, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And you have, you, have you had traffic studies done yet on that? That is in process right now. And, and a safety study then? Because that are you know, you know, that part of the curve of uh, Ventura and Arc Drive, it's very, it's kind of scary over there. Right. Yeah, I mean, the traffic study, to the extent that they, they review um, safety issues, you know, circulation issues in the driveway, that the, they do weigh in on that. I, I guess, you know, I think it's really, you know, I like the other design <laughs> personally, because I liked having those open courtyards, but on that hand, but on the other hand, I like that you're affording that smaller apartment building a little more space and the trees. I think that's really good. Um, I feel like the overall design is quite, um, I guess, imposing, you know, as in what someone said, monolithic, you know, and I wish it was softer somehow. Um, and I don't have any clue because I am not an architect in any way, but it just seems, I like the glass part. I think that's really nice. And the seeing through the building, I think that's a very nice feature. Um, the pool seems great. I mean, I hope, I don't think the noise will be an issue particularly, but, and if the more trees you can put in, the more, and I guess maybe this plan sort of needs some big trees in front, you know, it just feels stark. Um, you know, when I look at it, um, and I'm a little bit worried, <laughs> this is going to sound so stupid. I'm a little bit worried about birds flying into those windows and, uh, getting killed. Um, so I don't know. I know there's things you can do to prevent that. Um, and I can get information on that if you want, uh, what kind, because there are things you can do because those are lots of windows and the birds won't see them and they'll just fly right into them and break their necks. So um, uh, that, those are my thoughts. Thank you so much. Good, good comments, if, if I could, this is Mark Lame, if I could address a couple of those really quickly. Um, uh, I, I think, I understand where the monolithic comment comes from. I believe that these now are, I mean, it's one, two, three, four, five pieces here that are more of a form framed piece, right? There's more building around a lot less glass. So that, I mean, 
that addresses the bird issue better, that there's a lot less glass than the previous design. Um, the previous design was more monolithic because it was three pieces across the front. So as far as scale, we've broken it down much more to bring it back to a smaller, more human scale and what we felt was more in scale with transitioning into the residential part of the neighborhood. Um, yeah, I think one yeah. comment we had too regarding the birds, and I think there was a big question in the previous project as well. You know, we had these um, corner windows, um, and I think that was something that was, you know, where people were worried about, right? Where you had corner windows that are glazed on the river that birds would try to fly around a building, but actually smash in the building. And the, the previous design was mostly, or, I mean, at least one third glass, right? If not closer to 50%. And, and uh, I think so having these sort of solids is really gonna help that issue a lot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The last design had a lot more glass. And then we, you know, touched on that issue last time as well, but I, I do think this design, it, it will be less of a concern. There, there will be less glass, um, but definitely feel free to let us know you know, if you have any suggestions on that, we're happy to consider them. Oh, I think bigger well, what's trees gonna happen is, would help. You, what's going to happen is you're going to have to put taller trees in front of all the five pieces so that the birds have uh, a tree to sit in before they fly in anywhere. Mm -hmm. we, we can definitely address that. Happy, happy to. I, I agree. I think it'll make the project better also. Yeah, there has to be some height with trees in front of these pieces. Um, let's go to, thanks Adele, appreciate it. Uh, Dean Cutler. Hi everyone, thank you. A um, couple questions. Um, the public access, I think you said public access. Um, that's voluntary. The the, um, the public access to the river walk. Yeah. So the the Rio zone stipulates that you provide some sort of access to the river, um, which has to have um, an accessible gate, I believe, um, on on either side of the property lines. Um, okay. So, it's so, a requirement. so you have to provide something. In the previous project, provided um, a walkthrough on the between the marshals and the west side of the building as well. But yeah, there has to be it has there, okay. has, there has to be an access to the river. Okay, so that's a requirement. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, just to elaborate a little bit. So it, it's it's a requirement to provide access, but it doesn't really give much detail on how you provide access. So. One of the goals here was to really make the access more visible, um, more amenable to the neighborhood by placing it next to the apartment building to the east. Last time it really, I don't think it was ever really developed fully. Um, it was next to Marshall's, it was a thinner walkway. It just wasn't as inviting as this one. So, so that's, that's part of you know, helping with the neighbors concerns, but also just making the project, I think, uh, having a, adding a feature that uh, I think makes it more attractive as a project. And is that 24 seven? I mean, who governs those rules or security, those kinds of things? <clears throat> Good question. I, it's not clear to us exactly how, I don't think it has to be 24 seven. I think that you are allowed to, you know, have a gate there and close it at a certain time, but I'm not sure of the, the you know, the requirements at this point. And so that, that would be interesting with lighting and that type of thing and how that might weigh in on some of the neighboring units as well. We agree. And, and GK's yep. uh, intention is to, to have that locked down at certain hours just for safety. We don't, you know, we don't want people walking back and forth, not only for ourselves, but the adjacent tenants in the neighborhood having just a, a, an open thoroughfare. Um, so our intention is to have that locked down at certain hours um, that's agreed upon uh, when the river uh, path is built. Great. Um, and 
the buy right and the off menu on menu, the, this 47 versus 45 is the building uh, closer to Ventura Boulevard. Is that at 47 as well? The portion next to Marshall's is the maximum height is 57. 57. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. And that's just to, to create this design feature where it steps down, it steps <clears throat> back from the street level towards the middle of the project, but also steps down from Ventura Boulevard next to the commercial zone towards the residential zone. Um, it, it steps down towards there, just as a nice transition. So 57 arriving at 47 and the others are slightly, the three in the middle are stepped down as well? Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly the height of those. Johannes, do you, do you know? Apologies, I think I accidentally muted you, Dean. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, the, the pieces in the middle are similarly high. So um, I think 57 is the tallest spot. And then you're probably looking at between 56. Um, yeah. So these are all similarly high. The real step down happens right at the corner with this. Um, uh, with the deck uh, up here in the, in the north corner, <coughs> where it's the lowest. There, there's actually some um, work that's happening with this uh, parapet, where you know it actually goes down a little bit here um, to kind of create the shape. So Adele had mentioned maybe if that might be modified per se, but how, what what is, um, so it's roughly 12 feet over the, uh, that's part of the request by right on the, um, let's call it the left building, the first height there. It, that's right, it's roughly 12 feet over the by right amount at the, at the street level. Huh. Um, I know it's going to have a lot of impact as you come west on Ventura. I'm just curious, a couple of design things. I mean, it's interesting design. I understand the monolithic thought. Have you, a couple of thoughts, have you thought about reversing the order from left to right? Does that make Ventura Boulevard, does that make it less impact? Is it even feasible in a way um, on the height? reversing that step down versus step up? I think, oh, maybe I'll let Mark speak about that. With the, with reference to the angled parapets, and yeah, just, angled just bottoms? Maybe how it appears. No, just the overall height. Uh, well, I'm looking from floor to top, from ground level to the top. Um, well, it's, 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 as far as the kind of movement of the building where one point's higher at the end that just seemed to work with the composition of the building better. And then naturally the, the, the last piece closest to the apartment building was a conscious effort to step that lower to help transition that height to, to the, you know, two and a half story apartment building next door. Mm -hmm. Also, having the double height space on the corner with the glazing, um, you know, if, if we had stepped down on the left, you'd end up with very little building. Um, plus, like Mark said, I think, you know, bowing down to the neighborhood seemed to be the right sort of um, move. And, and we went through, you know, dozens of options. <laughs> it was a process. Did you explore any? color or or color palette which you've got five separate kind of standouts there about any type of color i'm just wondering if there was light color or some kind of step down palettes if that might soften some of the this monolithic <laughs> thought or or view i mean i think some designs it's it's stark but maybe a little bit of color might soften um, some of that stark comment hmm. on the faces. 
I mean, I think the trees, the trees are going to help a lot, but um, white can be pretty stark and it's right in your eyes. So just curious if that was ever explored. Yeah, and we're, we're not anticipating this to be bright white, but more of a softer um, sandy white. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to go with a more softer, classy palette here where it's, you know, an, an off-white with you can see the wood on the bottoms to give it yeah. more of a warm feel. And then the cut-ins where the balconies happen are also lined with wood inside there. Uh, and then all metal and window, just a, a dark bronze just to give it more of a classy feel. And I guess where where the accent really occurs is those tile pieces in between the masses. Uh -huh. um, where you know i guess if we we're going to explore color that would be the place to explore color i kind of feel on these five fronts if we put any color to that it would actually make it much louder well i'm thinking i'm thinking very soft color but i understand the earth tone overall theme yeah is that what kind of wood is that wood or is it um some kind of a um some of the other types of materials that uh, are, are you picking veneer. Yeah, oh. underneath. Um, it, it 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 may be an actual wood product where it's um, like freeze dried wood, right? So they, they suck out all the moisture of it, and it's uh, it, it's you know very low maintenance when you do that or it you know it, it might also be a um, faux wood material but um, regardless the, the the idea is to actually really make it look look like it is wood not not some fake imitation no I get it um, I, I think there's some great fakes but it they also go a long way to maintenance because when the wood gets away yeah. it becomes a huge expense and detra yeah. detracts starts to detract from the look that you're trying to achieve and one of the benefits of the way we've designed this and this was somewhat conscious is the wood pieces are actually on the undersides and in the recess pieces so they're not taking harsh sunlight all the time Mm -hmm. But at the same time, from the sidewalk level, walking by it, what you're seeing is the wood because you're looking up at it. Okay. Um, lastly, on the low income side, the 17 low income, you said they were evenly distributed. So there's one three bedroom. Is that exempt or how, that's how a does great, that play into That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I can I can weigh in on that. So, by evenly distributed, we mean more more like proportional. So, if there are fifty percent of the units is two bedroom, then fifty percent of the affordable units will be two bedroom, you know, and, and so forth. So, with the one three bedroom, that would be such a small percentage of the total, then there would not be a three bedroom affordable unit. Um, Okay. There would have, have to be more three bedrooms to, to boost that proportionality up in the building. Okay, just curious how that fit in. Um, okay, uh, at least I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Dean. Jesse Porter, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, thanks uh, for the presentation, everyone. Um, very interesting. I think the design is very compelling and it's obviously uh, provoked a lot of conversation here, which I think it's great. I think it's um, interesting, um, uh, att certainly attractive from a lot of angles. Um, but uh, it seems like between uh, stakeholders and board members, we keep coming back to this question of um, trees. Um, and I'm, uh, I have a two part question uh, to sort of follow up on what's been said and, and asked already. I'm not sure if um, if uh, the question that Melanie asked and that Adele echoed was ever fully uh, answered vis-a-vis um, -vis specifically uh, as far as the existing trees, um, and I'm, this perhaps will be answered by the tree report, but if you can give us any info now, I'm sure we'd all appreciate it. As far as the existing trees go, do, do we know the, uh, the uh, uh, diversity of species that currently exist? 
Are there any that are uh, ecologically significant? Um, are, are there uh, any that have any sort of protected status? Um, and again, if this is all gonna be answered by the tree report, that's fine, but we, I, I know that these are things that we'll be eager to know. Uh, that, so that's A, and then B, with respect to the, the prospect of, of uh, taller trees in front, which it sounds like everyone who's spoken so far is enthusiastic about the idea of, um, I'm looking at you know, the, the designs that were sent to us and which would pretty closely uh, mirror what you've showed us today as well. And I'm wondering if, if realistically, is there room, I'm not sure what the, uh, how much setback there is from the actual, from Arch Drive to where the building actually begins. Is there actually room there for uh, uh, trees uh, to, to be planted that would ultimately uh, reach some significant height enough to provide shading and, and a sort of, um, uh, some sort of frontal screen, uh, you know, um, separating uh, the building from the street on a visual and aesthetic level, um, you know, mitigating uh, uh, the need for um, air conditioning and everything else. Uh, is there room for that? Uh, is there enough setback that a tree of that size could actually exist in that space? And how deep is that? What's the, um, what is the actual uh, uh, physical uh, setback from the street to the, uh, to the front of the building? Well, I can well, be honest be goes to the site oh. plan. Um, I could speak to, to trees a little bit while he's doing that, but there, you know, there, there are obviously a, a large variation of tree species that you can choose and some don't have a full um, wide canopy and grow more vertically. And we, we actually use those a lot inside courtyards for, for that exact reason, right? Because there's not the, the room. So uh, there's, you know, if, if that's the type of tree we need to use here, then, then you know, we can, we can use that here. Uh, and with that, um, you know, on the right side, there's a portion that we're not showing landscape that is actually landscape. You can see where the property line is that says front yard. Um, I guess that's one foot six, but um, how the building doesn't just hug the property line allows some opportunities where there's more space to fit in a tree here and there. Yeah, the, the one six is uh, from the specific plan. Um, it requires a one foot six setback and um, in, in terms of the your question A, the, there is no protected trees um, or any significant uh, trees per the arborist report. And you can see that those trees along the um, east, north, and, and west that are green outlined are, are all the protected trees or all the all the existing trees i should say all the existing trees okay yeah so the ones on the right are we're, we're definitely keeping all those the ones along the north along the river are all staying the ones along the left side we are doing our best to maintain um but we'll like i said we'll, we'll really have to get into the details of that mark i was able to find the tree study that we had done it you're you're correct there are no protected trees on here and everything is almost on the prop the the, the uh they're almost on the property line in all cases okay thank you thank you thank you richard niederberg yeah my question very simple, basically. Um, oh, wow. Okay. First, is there, uh, we touched on it before, is there any kind of lead um, certificate for this building at all? And uh, I'm just wondering, basically, with all the windows showing through, are people going to put drapes in there? They're trying to block the view of the DWP building? The project is not not uh, going for LEED certification, um, which is actually fairly rare in these days because the California energy requirements actually surpassed LEED 
in the last few years. So leads become somewhat obsolete unless you're going for a platinum level. Um, as far as window coverings and stuff, I'll, I'll let Emily from Gold Rich Kest speak on that. Sure. Um, so because these are residents' private homes, um, we can't preclude them from, from putting up any sort of drapes. Um, we'll, we'll most likely have uh, uh, roller shades that will be in each of the the, um, the units as part of the the amenities that come with them, uh, just so they can block out sun and and have privacy as well. So that's my intention is to have roller shades in here, um, and so you're not having sort of a mis you know mismatched set of, of drapes everywhere. But as far as the ground floor glass goes, I think that will remain, yeah. As if, if that's the question, no, I don't. I don't see that we'll have anything up there. We want it to remain very clean uh, and and lead that transparency through the building, certainly. Um, and this will be an amenity space where you know people are coming. The mail is here. There's lots of co-working spaces and convivial spaces. Um, we want that to be light and bright um, as much as possible. Are you worried about the LADWP? Um... The, the look of the LADWP building across the street or their front yard or? Not really, the, I mean, the, uh, the, the facade of that building is, is, is not offensive. It's got the little parklet, it's with the, the landscaping. I'm not worried about, about the view out that side of the building. So no, I, my intention is not to direct an interior designer to put up any sort of drapes there. Thank you. Thank you. Barry Johnson, you had a question. Oops. Barry Johnson. Oh. Barry Johnson. Barry Johnson, last time. He must be preoccupied. Either that or he can't get himself unmuted. Okay, let me see if anyone else has any questions. No one else. Um, did you want to close with anything, Jonathan, Emily, Johannes? Um, no, I just, just thank you all for your comments. Um, I think, yeah, the goal is always to get feedback early and, you know, improve the project uh, as much as we can. So I think you gave us some good, good comments to work with, and we appreciate it. Okay, and you did say that this is going through a CEQA review and um, you are waiting on the traffic study and so forth? That, that's right. Okay. Um, Will you send the uh, tree report then? Sure, we're happy to do that. Great. Anything else from the committee? No. Um, okay, so uh, just some comments. Uh, like I said earlier, when this project came to us in September of 2019, we did support it as it was, um, as it was shown earlier uh, with the photos. I like that project. I like this project. Um, I think it will definitely enhance this portion of the neighborhood quite a lot. Um, Arch Drive is mainly apartment buildings. I think this will just, again, enhance Arch Drive in a way where it will elevate it to um, just a better looking street corner. Um, I have spoken to and 
been out with council member Raman's office um, and discussed possibly putting in something that will slow traffic down at this curb there. Um, I don't think the possibility of a crosswalk is feasible just because of the curve itself, but something is being discussed to make sure that traffic does slow down coming west from Vineland, uh, heading to the stoplight at uh, Marshalls. So um, aside from that, I, I like this project a lot. I think it's gonna be just wonderful to have this fresh look right at that corner there. Uh, my only concern would be the, the part that's facing the river. If you could in any way um, take the portion that attaches to the river um, for you to maintain yourselves as opposed to just relying on the county to make sure that it's clean or landscaped and whatnot. So it would just be great if you guys took that on. And also on the front side on Arch, um, making sure that there is a storm drain uh, put in, wherever that may be, I do not know that you would have to look into on your own um, because it's just a very odd corner right there. I like the fact that you're not gonna have a commercial presence. So I do support that. Um, so aside from that, um, streetlight designated, da, da, da. I'm just looking at my notes. Um, and also, I like the fact that you are bringing this setback, the side yard, uh, to 15 feet, making sure that you have some tall trees there um, for the separation between the building next door and this building. So having said all that, um, I move to make a motion. Richard, did you want to, let, uh, let me just, before I go, ask Patty. She has a question. Patty Kirby? I, I had to step away for just a second. I don't know if you covered this, but anywhere in any city, um, people aren't talking about moving trees if they have to uh, take them away from a certain area and, re and move them to another. Is that an option in anything you would have to tear down, for example, of a tree? Because right now it's been demoed. Um, have you moved the trees already? Uh, were there any trees that had to be moved or are there going to be? No, we've demoed the site. It, it's pretty clear throughout the center of the site. Again, all of the trees that are existing line um, the uh, east, west, and north side of the site. Um, it, again, once we get have an arborist on, on board, we'll know if we have to remove any trees. Um, none of those, again, are protected, uh, but we'll certainly explore that if, if there's some sort of uh, remediation that we have to do. Actually, I was thinking more in the area of replanting them somewhere else if you have to move them. They, these, I can just interject here. These, these trees are 50 to 60 feet tall, fully mature trees. Trees this size do not get relocated. The, the cost to do that would be astronomical. Okay, thank you. Barry Johnson. Why do we keep losing him? Barry? He must be having a hard time unmuting himself. Or no, he has unmuted. Are you there? I have a question. Who's that? Can anything be done with balconies so people won't store stuff on the balcony, which looks really ugly? As the property operator, we agree. We will have covenants in the lease that that forbid them to have uh, 
use that as storage. And then of course, uh, it's always a battle to enforce that as well, but that's our goal as well, because we want it to be open. Of course, you know, we'll stipulate what sort of things they can have, whether it's cafe tables, um, but I'm with you. I don't want it to, there to be a storage unit out there and bikes and, and all sorts of things that clutter the facade of the building. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, Lisa, I would, um, unless anyone else has any further questions that uh, require uh, making reference to the schematics, et cetera, I, I wonder if we might stop screen sharing now so we can uh, see each other during this motion. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone want to make a motion? Should I go ahead and and present something? Anyone? Richard? No, I move that we basically looks good so far. If their hearing is actually four months away, I think we have plenty of time to talk. If there's anything that's questionable. That's right. Um, okay. Uh, the land use committee of the Studio City Neighborhood Council supports the proposed construction of the Crescent Apartments, an apartment building located at the primary address of 4260 North Arch Drive to include 129 residential apartment units, 17 of which will be set aside as affordable housing for low income households. Five stories with the maximum height of 76 feet to the highest point to include 145 parking spaces on two subterranean levels. Um, yeah, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Richard. All right, let's go ahead and take a vote. Adele Slaughter. Um, I abstain. Uh, Dean Cutler. You're muted. I'm gonna abstain as well. Jesse Porter. Uh, is there any, uh, I'm curious about these abstentions. Is, um, do, do we think we wanna table this motion until there might be more uh, documents provided to us or anything? I'm, I'm not exactly sure um, what, uh, I'd be curious to hear Adele and Dean's thoughts on what, why we're not voting on this right now. Um, for me, I, I think there is some more travel here and be interesting to see. I think Adele wanted to see a tree report. She should be afforded that. Um, there's some time. So I, I think it was a positive presentation, but I still think that there's some information you know, to be had and, and viewed, and it, it might be just slightly premature. Same. Okay. Well, I, I would, I'd like to see the tree report. So I know, sorry, we're not discussing really, so. So Jesse Porter? Uh, I'll abstain as well. Richard Niederberg. And so far, as uh, exactly as presented, but if it changes before the presentation four months from now, I'd like to see it again. Okay, well, um, I have too many abstentions, so uh, I'm gonna have to table this uh, proposed project until a later time when there is a tree report and um, until you can answer to all the questions that were presented to you. 
So my apologies. Thank you so much for your time. We'll go ahead and reschedule as soon as you're ready. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Sure. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to meet Thank you. Okay. Um, comments from members on subject matters within the committee's jurisdiction. Anyone? Um, I, I I didn't know if we wanted to address the um, what was spoken about earlier about having a um, forming some kind of an ad hoc committee or something like that for the Harvard Westlake project. Um, I do know that the um, the ad hoc committee that was formed did a lot of work and sent a memo to um, Randy on Sunday. And I'm kind there of- There is an ad hoc committee. There is an ad hoc committee, I know. Okay. But I think we so should do something. I think, I, I think my thought was we would maybe um, have someone like Jesse or something um, be on the committee with them so that we can get have a line of communication. Um, so to answer the question that was proposed earlier, um, I made sure that everyone's comments were on record from last month's meeting. So um, nothing went up in smoke. It didn't vaporize or evaporate or anything like that. All of what was said was on record and it was submitted. So um, I don't know where that came from just because I did not hand, mean, hand in a 600 page report doesn't mean that everyone's voice wasn't heard. So I am not in I think that's not about. what the that's not what they were talking about. They were talking about not having a comment by the neighborhood council or some comment into in before the DEIR. I think that's what people are upset about. But didn't you just say that there was an ad hoc committee that sent in a memo on Sunday night? And to to Randy. Okay. And so nothing happened with charge. it. You didn't see it. You you didn't he see was, it, did you? He was in charge of the ad hoc committee. So um, I did not, nor have I spoken to him about it. Uh, so I am just as much in the dark as all of you are. Um, so I don't want to point fingers at him, but I'm sure he took action with what whatever was presented to him. So I don't understand how everyone has jumped into this conclusion of nothing's being done about it. So with the comment period over now, we just have to wait for the EIR to come out. And at which point, um, hopefully all the information that Randy received uh, will be implemented in a way that is feasible to everyone. So with the ad hoc committee, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know where it's at. I don't know who's on it. I don't know what went on. I don't know what happened. Uh, but in regard to me and land use, I wanted to make sure that everyone's comments were filed on record from last month's meeting. I think land use typically is reporting up to neighborhood council. So um, I think if you did submit all of that, then and the ad hoc committee was organized through the council, neighborhood council, then it seems like they had the obligation to submit whatever needed to be submitted. Um, Cause yeah, I don't, I don't recall anything other than that. 
I don't know. Does Scott have Scott? Do you have any uh, input on this? Are you still on? I can ask him to unmute. Scott. Scott Mandel. All right, I'm going to go to Patty. Do you have a question, Patty, or is your hand? It's, it's, it's more of a clarification or a statement. It, the neighborhood, the city city neighbor council of which is governing this project has no comment. And that has been the aggravating part about this. People spoke at your meeting and nothing, there was no result from the ad hoc committee towards by the close of the, uh, of the comment period. Um, it's waiting for the EIR is now put us way behind and, uh, and it's a shame. That's really what everybody was trying to say earlier at the beginning of this, this meeting. I understand your point. Okay. Barry Johnson, did you have a comment or is your hand raised from earlier? Scott Mandel. What other questions were proposed earlier so I can answer them? Does anybody remember? So in regard to um, me and uh, my position with the South Valley Planning Commission, um, I am a commissioner. It's not a secret. Um, I have recused myself from any Studio City matters that have come before the South Valley. I don't plan on voting on anything that comes before the commission that has to do with Ventura Boulevard, specific plan, Studio City. I really wanna make that clear. So um, if you have anything else to ask me about that, you can always send me an email or give me a call. Everyone has my number, I'm sure. And if you don't, you can get it from either sending me an email or asking someone that you know. But if my committee or anyone here present right now has a question for me in regard to that, please go in and ask. No one? No one, not a single word. Adele, did you take notes from earlier? Do you have any of the questions that were asked that I can answer? Um, well, you answered one about the South Valley thing. Mm -hmm. um, there has and been, by the way, there has been a couple of uh, items that have come before the commission that I have recused myself. Um, and filled out the necessary paperwork for my recusal and, um, and did not vote. And, and you recused yourself because they came before the neighborhood council, the same thing? Uh -huh. I don't understand. Oh, I see, I, I didn't know. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't know, I just thought that maybe it would be nice. I think that the ad hoc committee that Randy's formed is good. Um, and I thought it would be nice if we had uh, someone from our committee on that committee. I mean, you know, Dean well, or Jesse or something. You know about it more than I do. So I only know because, because uh, I, uh, Chip Meehan, who is the, he made the chair of the committee, okay. um, talked to me uh, today, today, you know, he, he talked to me today about it and I, I only just got filled in. So, um, you know, I just thought I, I don't want to be on it because um, I don't think it, I don't want to be on the ad hoc committee because I already did the other 
ad hoc committee. And I think that other people should weigh in and, you know, I'll help anybody, whatever, but. So you know more than I do. I didn't even know, I don't know Chip. I haven't spoken to him. No one has introduced me to him. No one has said, here is Chip, the chair of the um, ad hoc committee. So. Um, I, I think what people are also complaining about is that Randy has kept um, everyone pretty much, including you, in the dark and that people are upset about that because this is a land use issue. It is a, a, one of the biggest projects in Studio City, um, bigger than any of these other projects that we've been looking at, so. Well, I personally um, made, as a stakeholder, uh, made my comments known. I submitted them uh, asking for the community benefits that I, personally as a stakeholder uh, thought that would benefit the community. Um, having a street light uh, installed at Whitsit and Valley Spring Lane, um, you know, removing the, the animals as humanely as possible to other sanctuaries and a list of other things. So, um, you know, I, I can't say any more than that about I, it. I think we need to just find out where Randy is with it and what the committee did and, and what happened. We're all sitting here at a loss and we have some questions and some some comments to be aware of and, and report back to stakeholders or be able to, to have more knowledge than we do. It's, um, it's an interesting position probably we can't answer it at the moment and we need to ask Randy that question. Or the ad hoc committee, what what materialized, what what went on with the committee. Right. So if they had their notes, um, as you said, Adele, by Sunday night, was it submitted on Sunday? Did Chip submit it to Kimberly Henry on Monday or Sunday night or emailed it no, to No, no, because he no, he, he didn't have authority to do that. He, he can't submit something on behalf of the neighborhood council without the neighborhood council weighing in on it. He, he submitted it to Randy. That was all, that's all I know. I don't know what Randy's response to it was. Mm -hmm. um, the, and um, he, I mean, what Chip thought was going to happen was there was going to be a Studio City Neighborhood Emergency Board meeting to discuss their findings, and then they could make recommendations uh, or comments, in, comments really, to the um, DEIR. Um, his comments are just mostly questions, as far as I know, like things that are unanswered in the DEIR. Hmm? Okay. okay. So I guess we have to get back with Randy and find out what he's, what's going on. Yeah. Um, I guess by next Wednesday, we have our neighborhood council meeting next Wednesday. Yeah, I think we can be certain it's gonna come up with public comment. So um, several we times, I'm sure. Must, must definitely be uh, prepared. Yeah. Um, right. Anything else? Anyone? I, I don't disagree that someone from land use should probably be part of that ad hoc committee. We should probably be finding out what they did, didn't do. I, I wish I had the time. I would, would participate if I felt like I really could dedicate the time, but with everything and also my obligations and responsibilities under the business improvement district and all, I'm, I'm pretty stretched with my volunteer hours, um, even though I'm very interested in, in wanting to, you know, participate.
So if you didn't want to, Adele, you can't. Um, Jesse, did you want to participate? I, yeah, it's very interesting, uh, certainly, and obviously um, incredibly urgent, uh, this particular juncture. Um, maybe it's something we can talk about offline, but um, you know, not to take up any more of our stakeholders' time right now, but, uh, but you know, potentially so, yeah. I mean, somebody's gotta do it, absolutely. Great. Um, so we can talk about that at some point tomorrow. Um, okay, anything else? Any other questions for me and your concerns for me and my position with the specific plan, South Valley, land use? Doesn't seem like it. Um, my request would be anytime anyone has a question for me to just go ahead and call me or send me a text or an email. I'm more than happy to have any kind of conversation with you instead of just having these closed door, behind closed door conversations amongst um, one, two, five, 17, 85 people um, of Studio City. That way I can actually answer your questions directly instead of hearsay. Uh, I don't appreciate it. I don't like it. I don't like being talked about behind my back, lies being just thrown around um, about me just because. And it doesn't sit well. No one appreciates it. Certainly not me. Um, and with that, uh, I move to adjourn. Thank you so much. Lisa, didn't you say you had an announcement? Um... Yes, thank you so much for remembering. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Thank sure. you so much. So, um, Saturday night, um, Andrew Sussman passed away. Andrew Sussman was a land use committee member, as well as a board member. He was the nicest gentleman, at least to me. He's been a resident of Studio City for a very, very long time. And as a matter of fact, he's the one who brought the motion in 2019 for the Crescent Apartments. So, um, you know, he's been, he had been battling with cancer I don't know if you recall, but he started out with our committee. Um, and one day I received this call from him saying that he had to resign because he had uh, been diagnosed with cancer. So sadly, he did pass away Saturday night and it really has shaken me and, and it's very sad. He was such a smart, talented architect and a community member. And, you know, he really just took special care with whatever projects that we had on land use. And um, I'm just going to miss his friendship and the lovely person that he was. May he rest in peace. Mm -hmm. So sorry. Thank you. Um, there will be uh, something for him in June, and I think donations have been requested. So I can pass along that information to anyone who would like it. Please. All right. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great night and a great weekend and see you at the board meeting next Wednesday. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.